in the part of Brazil that I live in, which is subtropical, uh, you can grow just about anything you can grow anywhere in the world. Uh, it's a little bit harder because you have you don't have the harsh winter for winter kill. It kills your insects and disease. So, so that makes it. Farming, yeah, but you you can farm the year round, grow anything, you name it, apples to oranges, sugar cane. Uh, well, we raise cattle on our place and pecans, pecan trees on our fazenda That's neat. there. Now, what what do you think about all this activity? How does it how does it make you feel to see that the uh, the Malabar is still still vibrant today? Well. It, it's something that I, I was saying this morning is that uh, I've, or, I grew up here. It was our farm, you know, our family farm. But I always knew that it, it wouldn't be mine. I own farm someday. I just knew that. And I think perhaps that was one of the reasons that we went to Brazil and made our own farm. Uh, at the same time, I'm very glad that things turned out as they did that the farm was eventually donated to the uh, state of Ohio so that it could stay in one piece and be used as it's being used today because I think there's a tremendous need for people to get together and uh, and see how what all this business of what people call a sustainable farming is about and this is a wonderful place for it to be demonstrated and my father's ideas are being used here and uh, I can think of nothing that could be more useful or better. It just seems to me just the, the perfect thing. Now, some of, your, some of your father's ideas, how do you, looking at, at the state of agriculture today and the, and the whole environmentalist movement in the world, mm -hmm. how, how do you feel that uh, it seems like a lot of those ideas have really taken hold well, and expanded? Well, they have because uh, one thing that my father used to say a lot about he said farming real farming never begins until all the land is taken up and uh, that's when you begin to repair your mistakes and you see this happening everywhere in brazil we see it happening in land that was uh, that was planted to coffee 40 years ago and became worn out and eroded and now they're doing the kind of practices that we do here at malabar there producing better crops than they've ever produced in their lives. And it's a, the reason that they're doing it is because they can make money at it, it's practical. And I think that's what's happening here, as far as I know about the United States as well. It's a very common sense kind of farming that goes on. Yeah, I, I, think, you're, I think you're referring to where, where he wrote about that uh, in the old days, people would, would farm a, a plot until, until it wore out and move mm -hmm. on because there was always well, Yes, that was one land. thing, true. And then another uh, movement that went on in farming, as we all know, was over-cultivation. Our universities taught it for years to just turn the soil into fine dust, fertilize it as much as you can to make it produce it to the maximum. And it was a little bit overdone. It, it forced the land and it forced uh, situations in which the soil became compacted. and. Um, Actually, what my father's ideas and many others, it was a very simple thing. It's to try to keep your organic material uh, alive in the soil so that the soil is more able to accept fertilizers and seed and, and uh, protect itself, be a healthy soil. And that's different, you know, it's, not, it's different from dominating the soil. You're working with it. You're working with nature. Talking to, uh, to Max Drake earlier, and, uh, and a little bit about how how it's in some ways it's easier to farm now because you have the the uh, herbicides and insecticides, and he called it tr uh, trash trash. Mm -hmm, I think. Mm -hmm. so would, do you think? Um, how do you think things have changed since since when you were here and then farming today? Mm -hmm. Well, just what I was saying before. You know, the, the the time when my father was doing all this trash mulching and all these things that they're doing today. Uh, most people were doing really clean cropping, which is no weeds and uh, you know, everything as clean as you can possibly keep it and concentrate on a very fine tillage. And so they were creating hard pans in their soil and uh, 
creating an unhealthy soil, basically. There's nothing wrong with fertilizing, but if you, if you have a good organic uh, uh, material in your soil, it can take better care of what you put in. You don't have to fertilize as much, for instance. It's, it's once you convert, when you two get over into this kind of farming, which uh, plowing, for instance, you don't turn the soil over, you just plow through, uh, your costs are cut down. It takes a while to turn any, you know, to convert any kind of a system costs money. But once you're in it, it, it should make you more money because you have less expense, for one thing. Would, would your father have approved of all the herbicides and pesticides? <clears throat> uh, to the degree that you have to use them, because it's very hard not to. But uh, what you want to do is try to uh, use as little as possible. And if you condition your, your soil and your plants, and genetics today, of course, has a lot to do with uh, you know, plant resistance and all these things. Uh, I wanted to ask you, um, we, we've been coming here for years, and we really um, find this a, a very, uh, it's almost a magical place to come mm -hmm. to with all of the, the history here and the, yeah. the special circumstances mm -hmm. around. Do you, do you still feel that today? How, does, how do you feel now as, as compared to when you used to live here? Well, <laughs> it's a little bit different, you know. <laughs> but I mean, even when I, when I lived here as a child, uh, my father had thousands of visitors who came on Sundays. You know, people used to come on Sundays in groups, buses, and and uh, he would give them a talk. And so we're quite used to having a lot of people around from all over the world. Was this, did this feel like a, a very I mean, not like today. <laughs> did this feel like a special place to you when you lived here? Oh, yes, of course. It was wonderful. It was, it was paradise. Now, you hear all the stories about all the, uh, the celebrities that, that used to come here. Mm -hmm. We've heard stories about um, Jimmy Cagney working at the, uh, at the vegetable stand, things like that. <laughs> what was it like to have those kind of people around? Well, they, you know, they just visited and they just took part in the fun. You know, they enjoyed themselves, had fun. We used to make apple butter and tomato juice and all kinds of things. Um, what, do you, what, do you, what would you like to see? Uh, for, do, you, do you think the future of Malabar Farm is secure? Or do you think there's some things that, that could be done to, to strengthen well, it? Do you like the way it's going? I think it's going uh, in the right direction. I think for a while there it was kind of wavering, but it seems to me that uh, the more it can be a, uh, a center of demonstration of how to use sustainable agriculture, the better. Because uh, research, you have plenty. You have Worcester, you have all the research uh, stations that you need. But, you, but this is a place which is unique because you have your forest around you and you have a place where you can demonstrate how sustainable farming can be practical. And the more it reaches the farmers, the better. Yeah, I, I think this is a good place for it. I think that the, uh, we, the whole environmentalist movement seems to be, uh, in some ways, going too far in terms of not. I think there's that's movements, you know. Right. Forget about movements, you know. Let's have something constant. That's what I always think. You know, there are always going to be this movement and that movement, and the movements will go by. And but you still have to have a consistent. Uh, program or system or whatever you call it and I mean those people who worked with my father he wasn't the only one who did this kind of farming uh, years and years ago they're all over the world and they have a, a consistent movement and I think uh, even government policies are beginning to change in terms of um, uh, you know land quotas and and um, which really, in a sense, obstructed rotational farming, which is so important, you know, because you get a quota of land and you couldn't plant anything else, or you'd have to put it into rest. And uh, that obstructed rotation, I think all these things are, are adjusting themselves. Tell me what else, you, what else you're doing with your life these days. Are you, are you, are you is that, does farming keep you busy? Oh, yes. <laughs> Still yes. Full-time occupation. Yes. Oh, yeah. Well, that's what we live from. Mm -hmm. Is uh, we grow pecans and we raise Santa Gertrudis cattle. And I write. Are you still for writing? The, yes, I write for the newspapers and magazines in Brazil. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm writing. I'm working on a novel which is set in Brazil. 
in a huge region called the Pantanal. It's the biggest floodplain in the world. A fantastic place. A very wild region. The setting of my novel, not where we live. <laughs> how, how is Brazil is it, uh, to live in as a country? It's a very, very exciting country. It's a, people are very dynamic and energetic, and there are millions of problems because uh, they didn't take care of their educational system in the beginning. So that, I think, is the basis that is, creates poverty and, and uh, difficulties of that kind. But uh, it's very, it, Brazilians are very adaptable, and uh, I, I, it's just a wonderful place to be because you can see change going on all the time. We, uh, we feel like <clears throat> we know you from your time here, mm -hmm. and, seems, and Brazil seems so far away. Well, people think of Brazil, you know, as Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo, the big cities on the coast, but the real Brazil is in the interior where people are working and changing and doing all kinds of things. And they had very modern agriculture, for instance, going on in these places. So it's not that much different than than being uh, than living and farming in the United States? It's a bit different. <laughs> you have a lot more people to help you. That's one thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Do you miss living in this region? No. No. Would you move back here? Um, what for? You know, <laughs> I live there. I, I can't say that I would because we're so rooted in Brazil. We have five children who live there. We have five, 12 grandchildren. We have, you know, all our life is there now. Any, any more writers uh, aspiring? In, writers the family? in the family? I have a daughter who uh, writes film scripts in Brazil. Brazilian she, film scripts? Yes. Is there quite a film industry in Brazil? Uh, it's small. But growing. It's a very, some of it is very good. Great. Well, thank you for taking the time to talk to us. Well, thank you very much. Yeah.